In Union, South Carolina, sits a beautiful house, which stands as a testament to South Carolina's not-so-beautiful past. Welcome to Rose Hill Plantation, saved partially because of its owner's legacy as the secessionist governor. Francis Gist was a Charleston merchant and state representative. Francis longed to be part of the wealthy Southern elite. In order to make his dream a reality, he bought up a thousand acres in rural Union, South Carolina. Because Francis had no children, his illegitimate son, William Gist, inherited 1,000 acres here and 23 people at the tender age of 12. After Francis passed, William lived with his uncle Nathaniel Gist, whose plantation happened to be nearby. As a young man, Nathaniel sent William to study law at what would be USC. While attending USC, William was expelled. However, he did manage to pass the bar. After becoming of a legal age, William took possession of his property. By 1830, William had this Georgian-style brick house built. Interestingly, I learned that William Gist himself was actually the architect. In addition, William had those that he enslaved, who were known to be wonderful craftsmen, build this home. In fact, one of the most moving artifacts within the home is a brick which possesses the fingerprints of one of his enslaved bricklayers. Um, they probably look like the bricks that make up this house. And this brick, it's pretty old. We've never dated it, so we don't know how old exactly, but potentially old enough to have been made by somebody enslaved here. And this brick does have fingerprints in it. What? You have a fingerprint there, partial one here, and one on the side. Wow. Mm -hmm. We also have some of the original roof of this mansion. White oak wooden shingles or shakes that would overlap down the roof, keeping it protected. These would have been hand hewn, likely by enslaved woodworkers. You are able to touch. In the late 1850s and early 1860s, William remodeled, adding a third story a back and front porch, and stucco over the brick. In doing so, this transformed the exterior into the more fashionable Greek Revival style, after which the house was described as being one of the most elaborate homes in the upcountry. Eventually, the plantation gained the name Rose Hill, after many varieties of roses were planted in its formal gardens. During William's early life, he was involved in many things, which today would be considered scandalous, such as two duels with men who disagreed with him as a lawyer. Over time, William grew his Rose Hill Plantation to 2,000 acres, and owned almost 200 slaves at one time. These slaves worked the fields, growing cotton, corn, and oats. Mm -hmm. William Henry Gist was the main owner, and he was a governor of South Carolina. He was governor from 1858 to 1860, just before the American Civil War, and he got the nickname of the secessionist governor, as he's the governor who laid a lot of the foundations for South Carolina to secede, to break away from the United States. Rose Hill was his main homestead. At its peak, it was about a 2,000-acre cotton plantation. And Gist, he actually inherited a lot of what became Rose Hill from his father. So in 1811, Francis Gist came up right over here to Union County, and right here purchased about 1,400 acres of land. 
He started to set up a plantation, and then Francis Gist died eight years later in 1819. A good chunk of everything that he owned, a good chunk of all his property, went to his only known child, the future governor, William Henry Gist. As far as we can tell, it looks like Gist lived here most of his adult life with his family, and at any point in time, there are up to 178 enslaved individuals forced to live and labor here and Gist other land holdings in Union. After emancipation, end of the Civil War, passage of the 13th Amendment, Rosa, like other plantations, switched over to tenant farming and sharecropping as a system of labor, with many of the tenant farmers being formerly enslaved individuals, especially true right after the Civil War. There were tenant farmers here from late 1865, the end of the Civil War, till 1939. The tenant farmers, they made labor contracts with Gist and later on Gist descendants to farm the land and do a lot of the same labors they had done when they were enslaved or that their relatives had been enslaved. And Gist himself, it appears he just continued to live here after the Civil War. He passed away, his wife passed away, their children and grandchildren inherited this 2,000 acre plantation, but were not interested in living here. So they started renting out the mansion and many of the renters were tenant farmers. So there was a period of about 50 years here at Rose Hill where everything was rented. Land, tenant dwelling houses, and mansion. 1939 then comes along, and that's the year Gist descendants sell the plantation to the U.S. Forest Service. Now, late 19... On May 13th of 1828, William married Lu Louisa Bowen of Lawrence, South Carolina. However, Regardless of his wealth, he was unable to save his young wife, who in 1830 passed at the age of only 17. It was 11 days after she gave birth to their only surviving child. The following year in 1831, when William was 24, his uncle Nathaniel welcomed a son. This son was named State's Rights. As Nathan fiercely believed, the States should be able to run themselves with very little federal government control. By 1832, William once again married, this time to Mary Elizabeth Rice, and together they had many children. The following year, in 1833, William and his beloved uncle were involved in the Rice and Bobo feud. Bobo was the builder of the Cross Keys house and a store owner. Bobo had made a comment about a girl Rice was sweet on, after which Rice and his friends beat Bobo with sticks. After this, William advised Rice to sit outside the law office so Bobo would come looking for revenge. William then told Rice that if that occurred, they would kill him. However, as it turns out, Rice, William, and others ended up walking past Bobo's store. Of course, a fight ensued, and Bobo ended up being shot at point-blank range. By 1840, William began his political career First, by following in his father's footsteps and becoming a state representative. In 1859, it is documented that William was outraged after the John Brown slavery uprising. Probably in part because he felt threatened as he owned so many people. In fact, after speaking at a public event about the issue, William received a pike in the mail from an unknown sender. Today, within the home, you can see a replica of this pike 
as well as see many documents about the people William enslaved here. Prior to secession, William sent his beloved cousin state rights to the other southern states to ask for support. During the Civil War, William served in the Department of Treasury and Finance and later in the Department of Construction and Manufacturers. In other words, he tried to ensure that the Southern soldiers continued to have clothing. Her name was Louisa. They married in 1828. And unfortunately for Louisa, she died only two years later. She died 11 days after giving birth to a healthy child. Mm. So how many kids did they have? Uh, well, Louisa and he had, they had two. By the end of the war, William found himself at a loss as his eldest son, William, was killed in a battle, after which William also lost his cousin, state rights, and quit politics. We set it up like a ladies' parlor. It could have been used as a ladies' parlor at times. His second wife, Mary Elizabeth, could have spent time in here working on sewing projects, reading. Mary Elizabeth was reasonably well-educated for a woman of that time period. Gist, he got a good education, as did his children. And his second wife, Mary Elizabeth, born to a very elite family. She would have learned reading, writing, math, but also skills appropriate for a lady, like painting, embroidery, maybe some musical talent, maybe some foreign languages. All the pieces in here, other than the print of George Washington, here, 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 and here, were done to the best of our knowledge by Mary Elizabeth. Some, possibly all of it, before she married Gist. Oh, my. Wow. So that could have been a boarding school project. It could have been, or it could have been something later that she did. Mm -hmm. um, quilt cover that doesn't seem to have been completed, but it's kind of Another small. So this is his only mansion that he had in Union County, or he had in Union that we're aware of. He owned an additional, we believe, about we it look it goes back and forth on what we can find on records, but an additional about five thousand acres in Union County. Um, and then he did have a um, mansion of some sort in York. It's a sturdy structure. It's an all brick structure. The bricks were probably made right here, very locally or right on the property by enslaved individuals. With about 50 years of it looks like the owner is not doing major repairs, any house over time is going to get into some dilapidated state. We utilize to tell the story of all the people here at Rose Hill. We mentioned Francis Gist, William Henry Gist's father. This is a portion of Francis's will when he died in 1819. This lists the 33 human beings Francis enslaved that year. Every person is listed with a name and a value given to them by an appraiser. You are welcome to pick up anything on this table and read through. We have copies of the labor contracts from early period, 1866 through 1868. We have also some holiday ads of the time, as we are in the holiday period. These are ads from the 18, late 1850s, 1860s, and 1870s from Union County newspapers. While William is remembered as the South Carolina governor who initiated the Civil War, he must not be given too much credit or blame. This is because South Carolina had been a legislature state since 1776. And even if someone else had served as governor, the governor did not have the right to veto the legislative state, even if they wanted to. There is no doubt after the Civil War, even with freedom, life was hard for everyone in the poor South, particularly the black population, as the area had an absurd amount of hate crimes. Over time, the Rose Hill Plantation became dilapidated, and ironically, some of those who worked the plantation actually began to live in the house.
which by that time was only a shadow of its former glory. In the 1920s and 30s, there are several accounts of a very ornate bed, which was potentially this bed being in this house. So we believe this is an original bed. And we think the armoire may have been here as well, as they have the same maker's mark. Would anybody ever lived in this house? Just candles, oil lamps, and fire in the fireplace for heat and light when the sun went down. And plumbing has never been added. No running water in the structure. We don't know where the facilities were ever kept or what they looked like, but this room we put some examples, luxurious examples from the time period. As far as children, between two wives in his lifetime, Gist did have 14 children. The 1800s and the centuries before, no vaccines, no antibiotics, at times limited to no prenatal care, and just a lot of diseases going around. A lot of people died young, especially children. The original portrait we have in here is of Ellen Douglas Gist, one of his daughters. Ellen died when she was five. Of the five children of Gist who did make it to adulthood, three of them outlived their father. One of them, Maria, was a daughter from Gist's first marriage. Born in 1830, Maria's mother, Gist's first wife, died 11 days after giving birth to her. But Maria, she survived, and she lived to be 70 years old. Richard and David Gist were probably pretty well known to this general area. They were the surviving sons of the secessionist governor, and both men were active members, we actually believe leaders in the Ku Klux Klan. Many white people um, tried to suppress those new rights, and this is when the Ku Klux Klan and other hate groups formed to suppress those rights with some of the most violent means imaginable. The upstate of South Carolina, including the Union, where we are, was a hotbed of Klan activity. U.S. history. You're seeing a beautiful house, beautiful landscape, but there's a very dark history filled with a lot of violence here during slavery and after freedom as well. By World War II, the home was abandoned, and so the federal government acquired the land and used it as a bombing range. To most people, Rose Hill Plantation had been forgotten, but that was not the case for Professor Duncan Evans who had fond memories of exploring the area as a child. During the war, Evans showed the old house to his friend Clyde Franks of Lawrence, South Carolina, who was able to imagine how the house once looked, and he instantly fell in love with it. Frank tried to buy the house from the government several times, but was unsuccessful. So, Frank's friend, Evans, convinced the local DAR chapter to purchase the home, after which Frank's gave the DAR some land that he owned as payment for the house. During the renovation efforts, Evans found some of the old wrought iron railing under the porch and Frank who was so passionate about fixing the house had it replicated. After Frank's death General Henry Arthur and Senator John Long petitioned to have the renovations completed. Oral descriptions were collected during the renovation from people in the area as to what each room once served as. In addition, paint samples were taken in order to paint the home how it once appeared. While most of the home is furnished with antiques, it is believed that the bed and armoire belong to the Gist family. In addition, above one of the fireplaces is a photo of state's rights. Today, while States is seen by many as a villain because he was a Confederate officer, this was not always the case. The once blue-eyed boy was known as Union Sweetheart. In fact, he was known as being a bold and intelligent boy. 
as a handsome young man, States practiced law at Harvard. During the war, States was present at Fort Sumter when it fell, and he gallantly led the 4th Alabama when all of their officers were killed, after which he fought in many battles until he died at the Battle of Franklin, which is sometimes referred to as the Gettysburg of the West. After his death, States was carried to Columbia, where he was laid to rest in a place of honor. In the end, States left only his newlywed wife, Janie Adams. This room, we believe, could have been potentially the formal parlor. Above the mantel, we have William Henry Gist, and next to him, his second wife, Mary Elizabeth. This room probably had a lot of conversations in it during the time of anybody living here. You can imagine probably talks of music and fashion would have happened at various points. Readings from the family Bible, political discussions, as Gist was in politics for many years. Gist's sons, after, after the Civil War, could have technically held Ku Klux Klan meetings in this room. By 1960, this home and 40 acres was adopted as a state park. Today, this park not only offers a beautiful house and grounds, but also echoes the past of grandeur and oppression. While the plantation house and the gardens reflect the money the Gist family once had, their wealth nor power could protect them from the same fate that we all share. This becomes more evident when you visit the Gist graveyard. Besides William, who passed on his plantation at the age of 67, and his wife, who was blessed with a long life, the cemetery is also filled with their children, which includes 12-year-old Clarence, 5-year-old Ellen, an infant son, and 31-year-old Carrie. In addition, there is also a monument for William, who died during the Civil War at the age of only 23. In addition to this, after doing some more research, I found that William also had four children buried at the Rice Cemetery and one at the, at the Padgett's Creek Baptist Cemetery. In memory of William M. Gist, born October 3rd, 1840, killed near Knoxville, Tennessee, November 18th, 1863, in command of the 15th Regiment. He won an honored name, girdling his young brows forever with the patriot wreath of fame. Slept thou art free and dost not watch with tearful eye the lingering death of liberty. Her memory is the shrine of pleasant thoughts, soft as the scent of flowers, rich as the rainbow with its arch of light, pure as the moonshine of the autumn night. <clears throat> she felt not the burden and heat of the day. She has passed from this earth, and its sorrows many. Who cometh to meet her with light on her brow? Tis the pure, sainted mother, spring onward, bear the children of her love from this region of care to, to that realm of repose where no cloud ever gathered no star no storm ever blows on a happier note besides exploring the guest house and cemetery which is open year round from 9 to 6 the park also offers a very nice nature trail and a spur trail which leads to the tiger river both of which are 0.5 miles while walking the trail, you may notice some red flags. 
These indicate archaeological sites. These sites can be found throughout the property and help to remind you of the hidden history which still haunts this place. In fact, even as of today, the park is still in search for the sites of the slave cabins and graves. Unlike the Gist Cemetery, most of these graves do not even have a stone marker. While reservations and a small fee are required to enter and tour the house, the grounds are completely free. While visiting the grounds, you can explore an original structure, which today has a small replica kitchen and the museum and gift shop. There is also an outdoor building with restrooms and several picnic areas. Of course, you can always stroll around the beautiful garden, which has roses and magnolia trees that are over 200 years old. While visiting, some of the interesting things you need to pay attention to include the side porch, which was a slave entrance, the iron fence that William ordered from a catalog in 1850, the original carriage steps, and the caretaker's house, where Charles Giles, a former slave, made tenant farmer lived. Of course, there are many other things to see and explore, but you will need to pick up the self-guided walking tour brochure to discover everything. In conclusion, I would highly recommend a visit to the Rose Hill Plantation, especially if you want to get connected with the people of the past who were a part of Southern and African American history.